if you want to be a successful leader, watch other people around you who you respect as a leader. And no kidding, take notes and think about what fits my style and how can I leverage what I've seen to make me more successful. Brett, first and foremost, thank you very much for taking time out of what I know is a very busy schedule to be here and to share some thoughts with us. And maybe the best place to start is with your son. Congratulations. Yeah, well, thank you very much. Yeah, as you know, I pinned the same wings on him two weeks ago that my grandfather pinned on me 34 years ago wow. when I graduated from pilot training. And my wife was in the Air Force for 20 years. I was in for 33 years. And now my son's off to fly the F-16. And so uh, continuing that Air Force legacy in the family is pretty special to us. Well, I forget if it was on LinkedIn or where it was, but I saw the picture and it's just like, those moments are just so, so special. And right. maybe the best place to, you know, kind of jump into this is, would be interested in hearing about your grandfather and your legacy and just kind of how you got into, you know, the Air Force and just sort of an overview of your career. because. You know, obviously it's, uh, it's pretty incredible. Maybe just walk us through that if yeah. you can. Absolutely, uh, and my grandfather never flew in the Air Force. He bought an airplane right at the end of World War II. Back then, like you could buy Jeeps wrapped in Cosmoline, he bought a Piper Cub. <laughs> and so he flew that airplane for, for quite a while. And then, uh, I don't know, some place uh, as I was growing up, I decided uh, at first I wanted to be a lawyer. And then I said, I don't really want to be a lawyer. I think I want to be a pilot. And so, um, I still haven't been able to identify the guidance counselor that said, well, you ought to apply for an Air Force scholarship and you ought to apply to go to Duke. And I did both of those and I ended up at Duke with an Air Force scholarship and uh, met my wife at Duke. We both commissioned uh, right after graduation. My wow. wife, Mary Ann, served uh, 20 years. She retired as a lieutenant colonel and then I spent uh, 33 years in the Air Force. I'll be darned. So most of that time, 28 years, uh, I was an F-15 pilot. I worked my way up through the various levels of command, and in my final command, I had the privilege of commanding our largest combat wing in Okinawa, Japan, 18th wing, uh, at an air base called Kadena, which was uh, an interesting job. About 9,000 people in the wing doing all the things you have to do to, to run a wing. At the same time, we had essentially a town of 25,000 on the base, so I was the, the mayor, the chief of police. Uh, we were surrounded by three towns that really didn't want us in Okinawa, so a lot of political dimensions to that, So, uh, but a really terrific job. We loved being in Japan and getting to know the Japanese was great. Wow. Mm. Then one day I get a call that says it's time for you to leave Kadena and uh, you're going to go join the IT, comm, and uh, communications, command and control, and cyber world. And so I spent the last five years of my career uh, working in primarily cybersecurity and helping to form uh, what is essentially the, the operating construct and the force structure uh, and the budget that uh, United States Cyber Command is now pursuing to defend our nation in cyberspace. Wow, and you were eminently qualified for that position. Oh, absolutely. I had a 1981 computer science degree from Duke that uh, <laughs> you could do the whole thing on your wristwatch now, but uh, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a great leadership uh, experience going from uh, being a, a wing commander, being an operational commander, doing all of those sorts of things. Um, had a lot of opportunity to, uh, uh, to do a variety of combat missions in uh, Southwest Asia. And now I'm with a group of folks who are looking at me going, why are you our new leader? <laughs> You've got wings on. Can't one of our own people good enough? Yeah. And so, um, so that's kind of started my leadership experience and uh, with moving from something that I was very comfortable and very familiar with into something that, uh, you know, was a, a completely new, if you will, uh, set of operations and set of tasks and those sorts of things. Um, but what I very quickly figured out and something that uh, I've carried with me is that uh, leadership is, is technology agnostic. Uh, and the things that made you a good leader that got me to that point in my career I didn't need to change because I was now working in a completely different line of business, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so uh, over the last seven or eight years as I've had the chance to, to do some speaking and now almost three years in the private sector, I, I see all of that is, is exactly the same. But hey, we'll come back to that a number of times, I'm sure. But do, do you remember um, the, the first thought you had in your career about leadership, like what it was, who you identified with as being a leader. You know, it, maybe it was formal training, maybe it was just sort of some informal recollection, yeah. but the first time you were like, wow, that's a leader. Yeah. I spoke at my son's pilot training graduation. I told this story. I <laughs> said, uh, 
Uh, I remember there are certain things that are kind of seared in your memory as you go through your life. And I remember uh, it was at Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I had gone through all my training. I'd gotten to my first operational squadron. And now we were off on our first training deployment because we were assigned in Florida. And now we were in Phoenix, Arizona flying a uh, you know, combat training mission. And it was one of those very clear mornings uh, just after sunrise. And uh, I'm taken off on the wing of of our squadron commander, a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Joe Gorecki, Gork, uh, Vietnam fighter pilot, all those sorts of things. You know, and we're taking off, and I can still remember that, how excited I was to be flying with the squadron commander. And he was the type of commander that everybody in the squadron wanted to fly with. And I assumed that was the norm. And what I found out as I went through my career is that, you know, there's no bad commanders. There's nobody that comes in thinking, I'm gonna do whatever I can to make life miserable for the people in my squadron today. But commanders that really inspire you, that motivate you, commanders that you want to be on their wing, you know, I've got the, some of those things that we've talked about. They've got that, that legitimate leadership aspect, but they also have that expertise that you want to learn from. And I think the term is, is referential, that mm -hmm. when you kind of roll all of that together, and after our conversation earlier when we talked about that, I really started thinking about that you know, cliches are cliches because they're true, but the kind of people that, you know, you'll fly through the gates of hell to and do whatever they say needs to be done. Yeah. And so, um, so what I encourage those new lieutenants to do is that when they see that commander that's like that, is pay attention, you know, pay attention to what they do. Why is it that, that you're inspired by them? Why is it that you want to fly on their wing? Why is it that you want to be around them and learn from them? Mm -hmm. And I think that's really sticks in my mind as the first leader who has said, okay, I want to be like that. And uh, there were several things I took away from that as I went through my career. It's interesting you're, you're mentioning, you know, some of those terms. I know we've chatted about them, you know, casually, but, but um, you know, a lot of people think of leadership in the context of power. Mm -hmm. And our founder, Dr. Hersey, kind of defined leadership as an attempt to influence and power as influence potential. And there, there's really these, these three main subsets mm -hmm. to power. And one is legitimacy, right? right? It's like you're the commander you know, you're in charge, you know. And the others are more on the personal power side of things. It, it's like, do I respect, you might be in charge, but do I respect your level of expertise? And again, we'll get back to your cyber command because while in the context of your, your service to the country, your ability to fly an F-15, mm -hmm. you know, might have distinguished you mm -hmm. when all of a sudden you're, you know, kind of get a lateral promotion, if you will, and you're in charge of cybersecurity, right. you know, why this guy? So, mm -hmm. so the whole idea of expertise. And then the, the other kind of the T word thing, you know, the whole trust aspect, the referent power thing, right. you know, do I want to be like this person or aspire to be something like them? Those are kind of three key components to things. I think the other thing you mentioned that's really important is most people in leadership positions they don't set out to screw things up, mm -hmm. right? You know, they, they don't, right, they, don't right. they don't send out yeah. to like, you know, kind of uh, disturb engagement yeah. or these other things. They have, they have the best of intents. But what mistakes, common mistakes from your career, um, did did you see people in positions of leadership making that really were correctable mistakes? You know, so things they were promoted into a position of legitimacy, let's say and you know their command or their tenure didn't go as well as it could have mm -hmm. because they did what i think there's a, a couple of trends i think that um it's kind of a joke but it's kind of true is that people get to a certain position like the, they they send you to a class when you first get promoted to general and one of the first things they tell you is that hey sam congratulations you're now a general you are no better looking and no funnier than you were before okay <laughs> so just remember that so so i think as as people particularly as they get more senior and they get into these legitimate positions of of power that uh that they think that is sufficient and that is not sufficient. You still have to, you still have to prove your value to the organization. You still have to earn the trust of your subordinates, and particularly as you get more senior, you have to understand that. Um, I saw this in the wing I commanded. I had five. I was a one-star general. I had five subordinate colonels that worked for me. Now they all had to do what I said, but how they did that and how they pursued those goals was going to be based a lot on the relationship I could develop with them, the trust that we could have. 
And so while there is kind of that hierarchical leadership, I think you're really effective if, uh, one of the terms I've heard is called uh, peer leadership, if you will, where, mm -hmm. where we're working side by side to try to get to the same goal. And, and you saw that very much if you work in the Pentagon. You know, in the Pentagon, I was a two-star general working over here. I had no direct influence over these other three or four, two or three-star generals, no legitimate power, if you will, over them. Mm -hmm. But I absolutely had to be able to work with them and convince them and persuade them that we had common objectives, common goals, and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one aspect of it is certainly realizing that legitimate power is not sufficient. I think a couple of other ones that stick out uh, frequently to me is, um, I usually phrase it as, what I said is not nearly as important as what you heard. And so <laughs> the ability to really fight for feedback, right? Particularly when you get to a large organization, you know, some studies say that uh, really, you can only directly influence six, seven, or eight subordinates, right? In fact, I got this question at the opportunity we were talking earlier about. Uh, I was out at Duke's uh, Fuqua School of Business a couple of weeks ago talking leadership. One of the questions was, you can only influence seven or eight people. How do you run an organization of 9,000 people? And I said, well, a lot of it's about communication, and a lot of it is realizing that what you said is not as important as what they heard. And so you really have to work to get down in those layers of the organization and walk around and spot check and say, hey, how are things going? You know, I, you don't go ask them, hey, did you hear what I said last week in our, you know, our commander's call? What you have to do is talk to them about their job, talk to them about how things are going, talk to them about, uh, do you feel comfortable that you have the resources, you know, all of those sorts of things, and you'll start to get that feedback. Is, is my message getting out? Am I setting the organizational culture that I want in the organization? Uh, but you can't trust that just because you said it that people necessarily believe it. And so communicating and then being able to demonstrate when you do hear something that says, you know, that is not what I intended and not what I wanted, making sure that you make a change and it's a change that people see that, hey, the boss listens and the boss actually changes. And I think the third one, and this kind of lines up with some of the things Marshall Goldsmith has in his books is, um, uh, the way I phrase it is, is never discount the possibility that somebody else has a good idea, right? <laughs> and so uh, when you're sitting at the head of the table, you know, and you've got six or seven or eight of your senior folks around there, um, and nobody's asking any questions, uh, nobody's giving you any pushback, um, everybody's just kind of nodding north and south, yeah. something's probably not quite right with the environment that you have set. Uh, yeah. And so it's really important, I think. So, so I think those three things is, is legitimate power is, particularly in the military, that's, that's where you start with, but it is not sufficient. There's plenty of people that have had legitimate power positions and have not been successful. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that communication and, and building that trust and then I think listening, right? That yeah. Other people have good ideas. And uh, uh, you know, one of the things I, I think about is uh, you know, if we've got an objective that I want you to get to, if I, if I tell you, Sam, here's what I want you to do. We're going to this objective. I want you to do A, I want you to do B, I want you to do C, I want you to do D. And that's not really how you see getting to the objective. And so what I want to do is I want to hear how you want to get to the objective. And maybe you want to do X, Y, and Z to get to the objective. Maybe I think, you know, if I did A, B, and C, and D myself, I would probably get us there, but this is Sam's job. Yeah. And so, I'm gonna be better off by letting Sam take the road he wants to go. Because if he tries to do it my way, he doesn't own it. He's probably not gonna do it quite as well. And we may get an 80% solution. Yeah. Where if I let Sam do it his way, as long as it's clear that he has my vision, he understands the objective, he understands where I wanna go, he's got the competency, right? He's got my support. And we'll probably get a 95% solution at the end of the day. Yeah. So I think uh, I think those are some of the things that, that stand out to me. Yeah, so many things to follow up on there. Um, I hope they don't come out jumbled. But the first thing, and one of the most recent things you mentioned, is um, you, you know kind of like Marshall's work, and, and and I think you know both his books, What Got You Here Won't Get You There, and also Triggers are are two of the best right. I've I've ever read. But the whole premise of What Got You Here Won't Get You There is just that. Yep. You know, there's so many people in leadership positions within organizations that sort of get to a certain level and they figure out, or they think the reason they got there is because they were the straw that stirred the drink. Mm -hmm. And to get from here to an executive capacity, it's, it's really about engaging others and, you know, you agree on the what, but the how becomes much more, you know, less dictated by your own personal experience and more dictated by, 
you know, by their engagement. The, the other thing you were talking about with the Duke students that were questioning you, um, you, know, you can really only impact seven or eight mm -hmm. people. I mean, I flash on a, a, a program that we have, it's been successful you know, with us at the Center for Leadership Studies for literally decades that, that Dr. Hersey used to use you know, personally was 12 o'clock high, mm -hmm. which I'm you right. know, yeah. gotta be familiar with, right? right. You, know, you, were, you were playing yeah. the role of Gregory Peck in right. real life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but the whole idea when he took over the 918th bomb group, um, he recognized that his message to the group was one thing, mm -hmm. and that was really pretty structured. Mm -hmm. But his message with Jesse Bishop, who was one of the informal leaders mm -hmm. of that 918th bomb group, you know, that was something different. And that if he could convince Bishop mm -hmm. to sort of see his vision, Bishop would take care of right. it, you know, you know with, right. with people that he didn't have direct access yeah. to. Yeah. And that whole idea of leadership as kind of a game of chess versus checkers, I, I think really distinguishes people that might be really strong, you know, first level supervisors you know, versus dealing through two or three layers to, you know, to mm -hmm. get something done. Yeah. Just as I've read more and more about situational leadership, by the way, when I first met you and uh, I told my wife, Mary Ann, I said, so I met the guy, he's married to the daughter of Dr. Hersey. I said, situational leadership. She goes, yeah, I remember that. She said, because, you know, in the military, the, the you know, at about the three or four year point, um, you go to something called squadron officer school, because it's the, you're, it's the first formal leadership training you have, and situational leadership was one of the things we were talking about the other day. Oh, she goes, oh yeah, yeah, it's directing, it's coaching. I mean, <laughs> this is stuck very clearly in her mind, and yeah. I, I won't say exactly how many years it was since she was a captain, but <laughs> it's been a couple of decades. And so um, I was gonna mention that to you, that uh, oh, yeah. that immediately came to her mind. But as you think about uh, you know, the different situations and, the follow and all of those sorts of things that go into the model, uh, back to your point, uh, loyalty is the one that I think is is key to uh, dealing with that situation that you highlighted from 12 o'clock high. Because mm -hmm. um, one of the things I, I think about is, uh, I call it the beg forgiveness, don't ask permission. If I could sum up everything I think about leadership, it's in beg forgiveness, don't ask permission. It's I want you to feel like that, uh, look, you've got a lane in the road, the more senior you are, the fuzzier the, the sides of the lane are, um, here's the objectives go figure out how to get there. And I think that's how most people want to work. Now, if you're in my office uh, begging forgiveness three times a week, then maybe you need to ask permission a little bit more often. <laughs> um, but I told those students that I had applied that from the first organization I commanded, about 350 people, all the way up through those, and then the big executive staff positions if I had, and I, I never got burned. And, but what has to make it work is kind of from the 12 o'clock high example, There's there's a loyalty piece to this, and it's, it's a two-way loyalty piece. And one part of it is, if I'm gonna empower you uh, to do what needs to be done, operate in your lane, make decisions, do things, if you do make a decision that I don't agree with, unless it's uh, unethical, immoral, or illegal, then I am gonna do everything I can not to change that decision, because I want everybody that works for you to see that Sam Hey, he has the, he's got delegated authority from the boss. He makes decisions, he gets things done, you know, and then we talk mm -hmm. about it. So the next time the situation comes up, you know, or a similar situation that, you know, we're gonna have a discussion about it. Mm -hmm. But the other side of that is your loyalty uh, to me. And I have to set an environment that makes it work uh, in the way I'm about to describe where um, I don't expect you, you know, especially when we're talking senior leaders, um, I don't expect you to just blindly go out and do what I want to do. Back to our earlier thing, if I'm not getting pushback and discussion in the yeah. right environment, then something's not right. But once we've all said, okay, the discussion's been had, this is the direction we're going, then I need you to go out and execute against that direction. Mm -hmm. And I've seen times in my career, uh, and at first I corrected it too late, and later on I figured you can't let this fester. If I've got any kind of sense that what you're doing is walking out of the office and going, the boss has got another stupid idea, but here we go, Yeah. right? Um, I also don't expect you to walk out the office and go, hey, the boss has a brilliant idea, because your folks will know, but you can go out of the office going, here's what we're doing, team, here's where we're going, here's our objectives, here's how we're doing it, here's why we're doing it. But for, me to, for you to be able to do that, I've got to create an environment where we can have a discussion and we can get to the point where you feel free to ask, okay, well, why are we doing that? I don't understand that, you know, and it, we'll have enough of a discussion where you can see my logic. You don't necessarily agree with maybe 
this objective at this time, but you see enough of the logic where you can go, this is not the way that I do it. But again, going back, Marshall's got so many good things, is yeah. who's the decision maker, right? Yeah. And so if I'm a smart decision maker, I'm gonna get all of these inputs, we're gonna have all of this discussion in the right room, and then once the decision's made, we're gonna execute. Mm -hmm. And then you've gotta, you know, you've gotta decide, okay, it wasn't my decision, but I understand why we're doing it, and I can support this, and I will support it, and I'll go on and do it. But you can't agonize over the fact that you're not the decision maker. I think sometimes one of the hardest things, most difficult things to do in leadership is it's easy to accept or to understand but you really come to grips with the whole idea that leadership is this multi-directional thing, mm -hmm. right? So certainly it applies from you as the boss, mm -hmm. influencing people that report directly to right. you. There's certain orders you give that need to be obeyed, you know, whether you're in private sector or you're you know, an Air yeah. Force pilot, right? The whole idea where you're talking about your Pentagon experience, Le leadership is also influencing peers where you have no legitimate power. Right. And a big part of it, it's, it's also having the intestinal fortitude, the guts, whatever you want to call it, to effectively influence your boss, to challenge up, to say things. And, and I think it's very indicative of, of good leaders. It's like, if there really isn't disagreement, if you're not getting some sort of pushback, especially if, you, if you're making big decisions, right. if you're trying, it's really your responsibility to, to stir that pot, mm -hmm. but just to think that what you've got is, is you know, six, seven heads nodding and you've come to the right, right decision. You know, usually there's trouble, you know, right around the corner mm -hmm. there. Yeah. But that's a difficult thing, you know, to build in. In your experience, how comfortable are people challenging up? Because you have a tendency to think of, you know, military organizations, wherever they happen to be is, well, here's the order. Mm -hmm. My job is to follow the order, right? But how much constructive criticism or pushback did you experience in your military career versus, you know, let, let's say with your civilian transition? Yeah. I've seen the same dynamic in the private sector that I saw in the military is that uh, I think once you get above, I don't know, let's call it the, the military to be kind of that major, that 04 level, you're, you've kind of come out of what we call the company grade, you're in the field grade. What I've seen in the private sector is once you become really that first time you're a manager, that uh, you have to fight to make sure that people believe you when you say, hey, I want feedback, I want to know mm -hmm. when you, you have a problem with what I'm doing, because our objective is not to make Brett or Sam successful, our objective is to make the organization successful. You mm -hmm. know, one of my favorite Coach K quotes is, you gotta play for the front of the jersey, not the name on the back of the jersey, right? Mm -hmm. And so, people have to believe that. Um, and I think that it doesn't matter, private sector or military, that the more senior you get, the harder it is for you to, to get the, the pushback. Uh, because people are worried about their careers, they're worried about, you know, um, how is this gonna reflect on me, those sorts of things. And so it's up to you as the leader to create the environment, especially with those six or seven that you do influence, because the bigger your organization is, the more critical they are, because they influence the next six or seven. If, if, mm -hmm. if you don't have alignment down there, then you're gonna have some serious problems. And so we've gotta have an environment where we can do that. So, so you really have to, to fight for that feedback and you've really gotta create that environment to make sure that that loyalty goes both directions. But, it's reciprocal. Yeah. Exactly, but you can kill it, right, in a second. And so I would look for opportunities you know, I'd be sitting at the table and say, hey, you know, we're, we're going to do this and, you know, here's, here's the direction I want to go after looking at this, blah, blah, blah. And I would look for opportunities if somebody came up with so and said, hey, boss, I think, you know, da, 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 da. If I could use that person's method of doing something or if I could say, you know, actually, that is a much better idea. We're going to do it that way. You know, mm -hmm. I know it's going to give me the objective the same way, but that starts to create that environment where, hey, the boss does want to hear the truth and they do want to hear, you know, other options for doing that. Yeah. Um, the other piece that I learned really not till I got to the Pentagon, and it kind of goes back to a previous thing we were talking about, is I showed up at the Pentagon as a two-star general, is that I found out there were a lot of decisions made by four-star generals that never got carried out, right? There's a lot of bureaucracy, there's a lot of things in there that are going on that just because the four-star said it, you know, not all of that stuff happened. Mm -hmm. uh, and you just have to realize that that's what the situation is. And if it didn't happen, it's probably because, you know, maybe it wasn't a good idea. Or maybe, you know, or there could be just evil people in there that are trying to block it, but yeah. not everything they said happened. And so 
one of the things that uh, a lesson I learned early on, I, it's another one of these, you know, one was more fun about flying, but here's another one. I, I remember um, one of the jobs I had in the Pentagon was Air Force readiness. So we had to report, are we ready to do our combat mission? Are we ready to do these things? And um, when I first got into that job, I'm looking at the data, I'm looking at things here, and, and I'm going, this is very thin. We do not have a good cause and effect relationship, which is really dangerous because you're putting a lot of money into this pot thinking it'll produce this result. And the data wasn't there to say, hey, we're putting the right money in the right, what we're doing is we were measuring stuff that's easy to measure. We weren't making sure that linkage was connected. So I went to give a readiness briefing to uh, four-star chief of staff of the Air Force and the secretary of the Air Force, so two most senior people in the Air Force. And I basically went through our reporting system and not quite this bluntly, but I said, we are completely screwed up. Our logic doesn't match here. We're, we don't have a good idea on where the money's going. Are we measuring the right things, right? Because if you don't measure the right thing, you could turn the dot green, but not achieve your objective. And I got done with that and the chief of staff, um, who's one of my mentors still today, uh, he said, ET, that was my call sign. And as a fighter pilot, there are many people who didn't know your real first name. And he goes, <laughs> ET, I don't think we needed a lecture on how the readiness system works and blah, blah, blah. So basically, bam, right? <laughs> and so I thought, geez, you know? But then I learned that every good idea has a gestation period. And so you've mm -hmm. got to let it fester. And no kidding, uh, about six months later, my boss, who was a three star, came in to me and goes, E.T., I just came out of this meeting and the secretary said almost exactly what you said six months ago, right? And so your ability to convey these ideas in the right way mm -hmm. uh, up the chain, to accept the fact that they may not be greeted with yeah. great enthusiasm, but if your logic is sound and you continue to support that over time, that you will frequently see that it comes back out the other side. Yeah. And as long as, you know, we apply the, you know, we all get more done if we don't worry about who gets the credit, then, then that can work. That is a great soundbite. Any really strong idea, you know, there, there is a gestation period, yeah. you know, that it needs to go through, especially if what you're doing is introducing an idea that challenges the system and to follow it would mean change. You know, so there's that initial pushback resistance, but by the same token, at the same time, there's there's also maybe not outwardly, but inwardly, okay, I don't know that I want to buy into this 100% right now, but I'm going to put this in the incubator and kind right. of see what goes on with right. it for a while. Right. And, right. You know, absolutely. Speaking to your military career here, Morning, like like what percentage, if there's a way to, to distinguish it that way, what percentage of what you know about leadership came from formal training like we provide, you know, like mm -hmm. situational leadership competencies, right. you know, versus on the job training, you know, seeing somebody that has one particular trait or something that you really identify with and then just trying to model after that. So there's kind of the informal side to leadership development. Mm -hmm. And then there's more of the let me introduce you to, you know, kind of formalized thinking about. Is there a mix there for you as you yeah. reflect on your career? and? Uh, to me, um, certainly most of what I, I'd say the vast majority of what I learned was uh, OJT, it was mm -hmm. trial and error, it was, um, it was feedback. You know, Marshall relies a lot on the 360 feedback, you know, and I had yeah. an opportunity to have one of those when I was a, a new colonel. So we had some specific leadership uh, training opportunities. Uh, and again, uh, you know, we keep referring to Marshall because he's got a lot of good ideas, but it was just like he said, I could, we can go in and have a, a one hour session, a one day session, we could have a three day seminar, but if you don't go out and apply that, right, and mm -hmm. put it in some kind of a structure that you're really gonna take those concepts and figure out how to apply them to your leadership experience, you know, then you aren't gonna, going to get anything out of that. Mm -hmm. And so there's a couple of times that, uh, that I did have some specific leadership training. One of them I remember in particular was uh, when I was at that wing in Okinawa and, um, we all came to a commander's conference and uh, in Hawaii was where the headquarters was. You would think that would be a really good deal. We didn't get outside that much. <laughs> so, but um, we did two days on really what it was about was, was how do you take your organization, which is 
by design almost pretty stovepiped. You know, I've got an operations group that flies the airplanes. I got a maintenance group that maintains the airplanes. I got a civil engineering group that keeps all the facilities. I got a mission support group that does all the education and personnel and runs the dining halls and all of that kind of stuff. And it's very easy to let them operate in their stovepipe, right? And be successful in their stovepipe, but you aren't successful to the overall mission. And so, um, that was a significant leadership training experience for me because I took it back to the wing uh, and I started to apply it. And this was a question I was going to ask you. You know, you talk about uh, situational leadership that's really guided at, you know, that first or second level of, of formal or legitimate leadership. How do you transition, give you some kind of model to, to work from? And as I was thinking about, I took this from this commander's conference, I took it back to the wing, and it was one of these things where uh, we called it strategic alignment and distribution. So essentially, I wanted to sit down and go, okay, what is the real purpose of this wing? What is our overall vision? What's our mission? All those sorts of things. Um, and so now, I'm talking to these five colonels who are all busy, they don't have time for this stuff, yeah. right? And so, as I was thinking about our discussion today and thinking about the leadership model going from, uh, you know, directive, telling, to coaching, to supporting, participating, and down to delegating, is that my leadership style, the more senior I got, the more I wanted to be in that delegating thing. Mm -hmm. And so, so this was my question for you. As I thought about that experience of taking this back, I brought in a facilitator, I made him sit in a room for two days and really think about what this was, and it was really hard for them to be loyal, back up the chain and support this. So while I completely delegated to them the running of their groups, mm -hmm. as I started thinking about, you know, I'm very much on that directive side low competence because I haven't really thought about how to do this. You know, I've been through this training session, it crystallized in my brain immediately what I wanted to do. But I felt like over the course, and it took eight or nine months, and I'll tell you how I knew when I was successful, mm -hmm. but I felt like at different times I was working through all four, oh, yeah. four quadrants of that. You know, because some people would start to get on board, other people wouldn't get on board. And so I'd be curious to your thoughts on that because the way I knew that it had finally caught on, and I call it leadership stamina, I had to continue to drive this, force people to report these metrics. I'm, I'm not claiming to be where Alan Mulally is, but it was a similar kind of thing <laughs> where I said, you know, like the famous story about his meeting where, hey, we're gonna meet every week and we're gonna put these metrics up and, and it's cross-functional. I'm not so interested in what you're doing, I'm interested in how the team's doing and how your part is contributing to that. And if you have problems, I wanna know about it, you know, and the whole story about, you know, yeah. all those things went on in there. And so. This was a similar situation, but when I say leadership stamina, I had to keep driving this until it wasn't when one of the colonels came back, but below the colonels there were 28 lieutenant colonels that ran each of the squadrons. And I always had a meeting once a week with all 28 of them. And one of them stood up and started showing slides and talking about how he had reorganized his squadron, you know, same thing, looking very cross-functionally, lining up to the wing goals and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I just want to applaud because I knew, yeah. that, and that was the most powerful message. You know why? Because all the other squadron commanders, they could listen to me say it all day, but when they see Sam apply these concepts to his squadron and he said it's working for him, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden they go, maybe there's something to yeah, that. Yeah, maybe there's something to this, yeah. So do you see that as you go higher, that, that situational leadership model, it, it's kind of like in, in one aspect of my relationship with you, leader to subordinate, we're kind of operating over in the delegating quadrant, but over here, I'm still trying to get your support. I'm trying to bring you on board, all that. Is, oh, is that correct? Absolutely. The higher you go in an organization, a condition for those promotions has something to do with demonstrated ability and willingness. Mm -hmm. You know, you're good. Right. You're good at something. You value, you know, being a leader, a formalized leader in the organization. So the higher you went, you know, in the organization, you know, the, the more you would rely on, you know, style three and style four. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's much more of a participative delegative thing. But as you've already said, you know, to use your own words, if, if you're going out to your key staff and you're saying, where are we? And you're getting nothing but agreement, that makes you nervous. Right. You then are challenging them more to make sure that they're applying the critical thinking that they need to be applying. And we used to really target most of our situational leadership training and, and still do for the most part at you know the, the first jump mm -hmm. like when you you go from being you know an athlete to a coach for the right. first time right so you're an individual contributor and you're really successful and that's you know 70 percent of the reason you get promoted is right. because you're good at your technical job 80 percent of the reason you struggle 
is because you were good at your job. Right. You just feel like everybody yeah. should do things the way, the way you do them. So what we try to teach people or, or, or say, here's the benefit of, of situational leadership that's grounded in this foundational organizational behavior, leadership development science, is, you know, it, it depends. There's no such thing as a bad style. Delegation yeah. works, participation works. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, direction works. Mm -hmm. It's all a question of when you do what. And probably the most inconsistent thing you can do is to treat everybody the same. Right. Because it's ridiculous to assume that everybody's going to greet every task, you know, with the same amount of knowledge, experience, skill, confidence, commitment, and motivation. Of course, there's going to be variability there. So if you want to move those folks along that continuum, you're going to have to differentiate what you do on the basis of who you're leading. What Alan did at Ford, Alan Mulally, it really sort of opened our eyes to the application of situational leadership in a board type setting. Mm -hmm. When he came up with his famous, you know, red, yellow, green right. system, and he was asking key executives, top 16 people mm -hmm. at Ford, as he took over the organization, and they were headed for a $17 billion loss, as I understand it. Okay, evaluate your plans mm -hmm. in the context of our vision. Green means you got a plan and you're seeing results. Yellow means you got a plan, but you anticipate seeing results, but you haven't seen them yet. And red is, uh, you know, uh, no plan, right. no results. Right. And each of those 16 key executives came back the first time. It speaks a little bit to the culture that Alan took over. Each of those 16 key executives came back the first time and they were all green. Mm -hmm. And Alan, my understanding, very calmly said, okay, so we're six months away from bankruptcy. We're heading for the largest loss in the history that Ford's ever experienced. And what you're telling me is we're all on track. Okay, let's do that exercise again, right? right. right? Mm -hmm. And finally, Mark Fields mm -hmm. emerges from the pack and says, well, you know, if we're telling the truth here, yeah. uh, I'm red. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I got to be red. And it was really a bold move Mm -hmm. on, on his part, because culturally at that point in time, that's just not something you did, right? right? Yeah. And Alan's response, and Marshall makes a big deal out of it, and he should, Alan's response was just, yeah, right. okay, great, right. thank you. Yeah. Now, yeah. you know, what are we gonna do? Right. And he credits that moment as much as anything to sort of applying situational leadership, mm -hmm. the whole idea of here's somebody that's admitting that they're unable and insecure, right. that they don't have a plan, mm -hmm. that divisionally we're really struggling here. Now what we need to do is get this person some direction. Right. Right. And you know, back to the power stuff for a second or two, the other thing I thought that was amazing about that story was, even though Alan was the CEO and had all kinds of legitimate power, he made a big deal about saying, by the way, I'm an airplane guy. I right. came from Boeing. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know how to fix your problem. But we have a lot of smart people here at Ford and we, we can get some consultants yeah. and some other stuff if we need to, but we need to get Mark Fields some direction mm -hmm. and, and I'm not gonna be the one that makes the decision to supply it. Right, right. Right. So in that moment, okay, he's still got legitimate power, okay, but he's basically building a lot of referent power right. with people because they're saying, wow. Okay, By acknowledging so, he has no expert. I don't know what we're yeah, doing here. It, it, Even it, it, if he did. Yeah, this is yeah. another key point that Marshall makes, and nobody makes it better than him, but he said, he said, what would have happened at that juncture if Alan would have said, well, you know, have you thought of this? Yeah. Have you tried that? Right. He would have gotten compliance immediately, right. you know, given the gravity of the situation, people probably would have said, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah. And they would have implemented his plan and probably failed. Right, right. So what he had was the patience to leverage his position, mm -hmm. you know, to, to sort of put it on them and say, if we're gonna get out of this mess, you know, I'll sort of orchestrate it, mm -hmm. I'll facilitate it, but I'm not gonna do it. Right. And that's a real key difference, I think, and in, in, in something that we're in the middle of is investigating, if you're a first line supervisor and you have the answers, like people are seeking your expertise. Right. Part of what you're doing is teaching them how to fly the plane mm -hmm. because you know how to fly one right. because you've flown one forever. Right. You have answers to their technical questions. The higher up you go, the more you're dealing with knowledge workers. And it's not necessarily you need to wait right. to get to the executive suite these days. We'll talk about your cybersecurity mm -hmm. experience. Yeah. Like you can walk into a room right away, first day as the boss mm -hmm. and be the dumbest guy in the room, right? right? So how do you influence people or effectively lead people 
that are 10, sometimes 100 times smarter than you <laughs> for that set of circumstances. So it's not as much as that you do situational leadership, you more facilitate it. Right. Something you know, that, yeah. And boy, I'll tell you, on a bunch of different planes, you know, that's where we are today. Leaders subverting ego and having the foresight to see my decision is, is in no way, shape, or form, <laughs> you know, going to right. be the best outcome. Right. Even if I've got an answer to the plan, what I really need to do is get these folks to align around something they buy into and then move forward. You, you've right. mentioned that, right. you know, a couple of times yeah. already. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, a little story they would always tell in the military, kind of to your point about what if he'd said, you know, I wonder if we ought to do this, is, you know, it's the, the wing commander that uh, shows up at the wing, everything's looking good, first Saturday he's going to go out and play golf, and he gets to about the fourth hole, and he, he hits it into that tree right at the corner of the dog leg, and the next Monday morning meeting goes, yeah, I really enjoyed the golf course, it's in nice shape, you know, he says, that, that darn tree, though, on number four, that thing, you know, is something else. Next week he goes out and plays, there's no tree no there tree. anymore. Yeah. Right? So you have to be, you have to understand yeah. what impact your words are going to say. But that whole story around the table to me hits several things is, um, one, I'm a big believer in, in organizational culture and, and leadership behavior sets the organizational culture. And if you can set the culture that you want, uh, with the appropriate vision and those sorts of things, then you don't have to get mired in the tactical details. There's plenty of people that know how to do that. I think the second uh, thing that he showed there is that uh, you're gonna get rewarded for making the team better. And there were a couple of people that, you know, weren't gonna be on board with that. You know, mm -hmm. as I recall in the book, there's two or three of those senior folks that yeah. left. But a lot of that was about creating, if you will, a safe environment for people to admit you know that they didn't have uh, that they didn't have the answers, and yeah. I think that I've definitely seen that in the military and in the private sector is, can you set a safe environment where people can uh, let you know what's not going right, and mm -hmm. then you know then there's an obligation. You know if if Mark Fields was still red, you know a year later for exactly the same reasons, then he got another issue, but this right. was an opportunity for him to uh, to get help, to interact, to create an environment. You know, and then I'm sure. Six months later, he's he's providing advice and support for another aspect of the company, you know, and, and yeah. it was that teamwork that they they built, I think, that that really made that successful. And again, it's it's testament, and it's why everybody everywhere is like singing Alan Mulally's praises these days. But can you imagine being a CEO of an organization that's leaving, and and getting what most people would consider to be a significant exit package, mm -hmm. in terms of dollars and stocks right. and those kinds of things. And doing that with a 97% approval rating, right, boggles the mind. Yeah, you did. You know, where, where it's just like, okay, so here's a guy yeah. that got a big check, mm -hmm. right? Um, and by the way, if it was up to me. I'd have given him more. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, that that's yeah. that kind of speaks to the you know the impact of not only what what Alan had on on the productivity, you know, mm -hmm. of like short term results or success. Right but also just the engagement of what it was like to be an employee at Ford. Mm -hmm. To that point, the whole idea of, of um, you know, culture and, and those sorts of things, it's really interesting, like you mentioned at the beginning, where you know, you were a fighter pilot forever and a squadron mm -hmm. commander and all those kinds of things, then all of a sudden somebody said, let's put you in charge of cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. So here you come and you, you go over there and you, you have this experience in the armed forces and you speak about this and very well, I might add, I've, I've seen a number of, your, number of your tapes and I've read an article, but the specifics associated with your advice on cybersecurity sort of, um, it, it started with CEOs taking it seriously. Mm -hmm. From your experience, how could that possibly be you know, the case in this day and age that you wouldn't be aware of or, or take it as seriously as you needed to? Right. Uh, what I've seen is they take it seriously, but they, they underestimate how far their organization is away from really having a culture that says, and I agree with you, there's a lot of disruptors. Cybersecurity happens to be the big one right now. The mm -hmm. technology is the disruptor. I think cybersecurity is, is a, a component of technology disruption in the sense that, that uh, technology is code for plugging into the internet and connected to everything, and with that comes great benefit, but also it comes with great risks. And, and business is all about managing risk, right? It's where do I allocate resources in order to mitigate risk, manage risk, you know, do those sorts of things. And so what happens, I think, is people who are at the very senior level, right, they, they know everything about how the business operates and they know everything about 
finance, right? And they know, hey, if I'm the CEO or I'm a director on the board, I've got a question about operations, I know exactly what to ask Sam, and I know if the answer is, uh, shall we say, um, less than, than rigorous in, <laughs> in the data that backs it up. You know, same thing, if I got a question about the income statement, I know exactly what to ask the CFO, and I know if the answer makes sense. But if I got a question about uh, IT risk or cybersecurity or cyber risk, I look at the CIO and I go, hey, Fred, are we good? Right, and that is completely different. And then the flip side of that is instead of me making meaningful statements, taking meaningful actions, executing meaningful leadership behaviors, I don't know what those are because I don't know enough about, let's call it cyber risk in this case, for me to do that. So I essentially delegate that to Sam. But when you need to change the culture of an organization to say that every business decision we have, in this case cybersecurity is our example, every business decision we have, whether it's an M&A, a new line of business, whatever it is, if we aren't thinking about cybersecurity and cyber risk and how that impacts this, then that's gonna have a strategic impact on our business. Mm -hmm. I can't change that culture by delegating that culture change to the CIO or the CISO. That's gotta be me. And so when I go into boardrooms and do these, these three hour sessions, the, the biggest message I try to leave with them is that, you know, you came in and got to this position because you know, let's just operations and finance, you know a lot about, that's how you run businesses, right? You know nothing about this, but if you're gonna be able to ask the right questions, understand the answers, know when things aren't going right, then you're gonna to have to dig down and learn a little bit about this. And I'll give you a quick example of, sure. of this. Is, um, when I showed up again at that, that wing at Kadena, uh, I had a civil engineering group. Uh, there's only five in the Air Force. Usually you have a squadron, about a group of squadrons. So there's about 1,800 people supervise roads, buildings, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so we'd had a runway that had been closed for six months while they were resurfacing the runway. And they went out uh, to do some tests, uh, not important what the test is, but they're driving a, a pickup truck on the runway, and the guy looks down and he goes, you think we ought to be leaving tire marks in this new runway? No, probably not, <laughs> right? And so it turned out that there had been a number of, of errors made in the engineering of that. We'd spent several million dollars <laughs> on it, had it closed for six months, a huge operational impact. And so I had to go in and eventually I'm standing over the shoulder of the Japanese contractor and he's showing me the chart of how much gravel versus how much sand and you know, here's where the mistakes were made, you know, all that stuff. So it was up to me to deep dive enough into that mm -hmm. so that I would know in the future, okay, what are the red flags? What are the questions I should be asking? I don't, I don't have to be able to do his job but I've gotta be able to learn enough to know what the red flags are and that sort of thing. Okay. And I think as a senior leader, you know, the first thing I've got to do is I've got to understand the people, those other senior people below me. Uh, do I trust them? Do I think that, you know, but if I have a doubt or if I have a question, you know, when I went to that wing, I knew a lot about operations, a lot about maintenance. I didn't know a lot about civil engineering. I didn't know, a lot, I had a 500 person hospital. I didn't know a lot about running a hospital. So those are the areas I went and spent time with and not just getting the, hey, sir, come on over, let's get you on a tour. I spent time sitting next to people asking, what do you do, how does this work? You know, what are the things that cause you problems? You know, all that sort of thing. Same thing when I get into the cyber job. Uh, you know, I had to build first empathy with that new team, that they knew that I knew how hard their job was, how little appreciated they were, nobody saw this as important, you know, all that sort of thing. So step one was to build that empathy. I think step two was to get enough knowledge on my side. I'm not gonna do their job and sit down on the keyboard, but this is a completely new field. If I don't learn a couple of levels down what's mm -hmm. going on, I don't know what the red flags are, I, and I'm stuck doing exactly what I said that board member is when he goes, hey Fred, are we good? Mm -hmm. and, and you can't afford to do that. So, so when we're talking about cybersecurity, we're talking about, I think, any other disruption to an organization, you're gonna have to take some of your personal time and invest in understanding, okay, what are the dynamics of this? What are some of the key concepts? Those sorts of things, so that I can provide the right level of oversight and leadership. And to me, not unlike the general that made a comment about the tree in the middle of the fairway, yeah. right? If it becomes apparent that the CEO, that they're really concerned about cybersecurity, right? And they're doing all this investigation mm -hmm. and kind of asking yeah. these questions, eh, that word's gonna get around, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. The, you know, the trees, somebody's gonna be uh, you know, doing something to the tree, but in situational leadership terms, if you have a CEO and they are not you know, they don't have knowledge, experience, and skill. Mm -hmm. They're, they're kind of R1. Yeah. They're admitting their own readiness, mm -hmm. you know, for that task and for the implications of it. 
their first step, nothing standing in their way, obviously, is to get better information so that they can make informed decisions. So as opposed to delegating something you know nothing about, right? Right. You're you're really in the trenches, you know, figuring that out. And also, I think, adding credibility, you know, to you know to the people that are in that division, to the CIO, oh, well, whoever else it happens to be. That's a huge point, Sam. That add credibility because. One half of my job was building credibility with all these knowledge workers, all these cyber people that this is my favorite team. Whatever team I'm on is my favorite team, and we're <laughs> going to go out and do this. But because of where I came from, I could go to the other ship drivers, tank drivers, airplane drivers, and I could get into meetings they couldn't get into. See, that's the problem that the CIOs and the CISOs have today is um, they want them to come into the boardroom or come into the C-suite and talk in business relevant terms and those sorts of things. And very few CIOs or CISOs, you know, they haven't spent the last 20 years in those meetings. You yeah. call them in when the video teleconference doesn't work. You don't call them in to discuss the next <laughs> acquisition, right? Yet now they're expected to come in and talk about ROI and in business relevant terms. And, and many, many of them really struggle to do that. And so, same thing with, with those folks that were working in the, the cyber and IT business. You know, they're toiling away. They don't really, nobody's helped them connect the dots from what they do to the mission, which is another huge theme of mine is if you're handing out towels in the gym in Saudi Arabia at our base, you ought to know why what you do every day contributes to airplanes taking off and putting warheads on foreheads, as we used to say. Mm -hmm. And as a leader, you have to connect people to that. And so because I could go into rooms and I could talk to these other operators, even if my predecessor had come in and basically said the same type of things, he wouldn't have said it the same way. But now you're going, well, ET's saying it, that must be important, yeah. you know? And so I found that to be a huge advantage for me in terms of, of raising the awareness and moving what I thought was the right agenda forward. But the other effect was now people started going, hey, we're about to start this important planning meeting and there's, there's nobody there from the IT and cyber side. We, we got to hold on and wait till we got to go get one of them. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because the video teleconference didn't work. It's because they said, this is, a, this is strategically important to our mission. And so now you got these people who had been toiling away in rooms with no windows, you know. Nobody calls you <laughs> up and goes, hey, the computer system worked really good this today. So I appreciate good. it, right? I just got yeah. on today. I logged on and it was and This perfect. is super. I just want to yeah. tell you that, right? Now they've got people calling them and not they're calling right. them because they, they need their expertise to connect to the mission, yeah. right? And so it drove the folks on this side to learn a lot more about this. And then once they learn more about it, they go, I need more information. I need this expertise in the room with me. I need this yeah. to be a critical part. And the self-fulfillment, that, that was probably the biggest, the biggest yeah. uh, personal pleasure I got out of that job was seeing kind of the chest puffed out and, you know, that whole sense of, hey, we're, we're part of the fight here. You know well, what I'm you, saying? You do a fantastic job of describing both sides of that, right? It's kind of like if you're in a support function and you're not used to speaking business terms, right. uh, there's a certain amount of it's on you, mm -hmm. right, to be able to learn those right. terms, to be able to make sense in those conversations. So if you allow yourself to, to sort of be compartmentalized, a, yeah. a certain part of that is on you, right? okay? And, and I see, and I saw in your article, there, there's some real parallels between the IT space, if you will, in the context of the big picture and organizations and the training folks. Right. Training people talk all the time about they want a seat at the big table. Mm -hmm. Well, the training people that have a seat at the big table, they've earned that. Right. They speak the business's right. language. Right. You know, they position training in the context of competitive advantage mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. you know, costs and what it means and how it contributes and all those kinds of things, but they're few and far between. Mm -hmm. Unless there's that initiative, that leadership being taken on the part of whoever heads up the training organization, you know, m most executives are not saying, Let let's get the training people in here. Right, right. Unless there's a specific special mm -hmm. question. But there's a push and a pull, right? Yeah. Because there are smart people that work for me when I first got to, it's called the J6, is the organization that does this. Um, and there were smart people in there, and they could knock on the door all day long. But until I created a situation where they open the door. So you're right. It's almost like your example of OJT is, is like I could be a CISO and I could go out and get my MBA at the executive program at night, right? And so, but if I haven't had the 
experience and I am not had the opportunity to be exposed to, okay, how does this work in the real world? And given an opportunity to let you know that, hey, I know how to fit this in, right? So, so it's definitely some, it's initiative on this side, right? To get yourself smart and take advantage of it. And sometimes to knock on doors where people aren't used to having you knock on the door. At the same time, as a leader, you've got to be smart enough to recognize, hey, here's somebody that, A, this is the basic leadership thing. Hey, here's somebody that's trying to make themselves better and contribute to the team and all of that. How do I mentor, support, and make mm -hmm. them more effective and integrate them with okay. that? So, so I think both those things go in there. So the whole idea of key executives and organizations that, that are, are uh, communicating that cybersecurity is a priority, right? It's, it's certainly their involvement in learning as much as they can learn. There might also be some accountability things, some consequences mm -hmm. for non-compliance. And I would imagine if there are some people in an organization or some key folks that lose their jobs because they're not taking these things seriously, you know, that can send a message very, very quickly and, and very, very specifically. And the other thing you spoke to that I thought was really interesting was, and it probably is what happened to you, if you take high potentials, if you take people that are coming up in your organization that everybody knows is earmarked mm -hmm. for great things, mm -hmm. significant leadership positions, and you put them in charge of, or you force them into lateral sort of moves within the organization that, that focus on cybersecurity, that sends, again, a mm -hmm. huge you know, yeah. cultural message there. On what's important. Yeah. yeah, and the first piece on accountability, you know, we kind of went right to, okay, if you don't comply, you're gonna get fired. You know, <laughs> to me, it's, there's a big chain before that. You know, one, yeah. one piece is the communication piece. Did I communicate why this is important and did you receive that message, right? Uh, part two is, you know, leaders uh, inspire, uh, they resource, and then they motivate. And the resource part is, did I give you the knowledge, skills, and abilities to be able to do what it is I expect you to do? And then, did I test to see whether my training had been effective? Because um, I'm huge on the difference between training and, and exercising, and this is an area that I think uh, Clearly, there's an advantage in the military because exercising is such a part of our, of our culture and we create the environment where the purpose of the exercise is to identify gaps and shortfalls in our training and to be able to correct those. What I've seen in the private sector, you know, what I'm exposed to most is the cybersecurity pieces. They don't create this environment where everybody understands that it's, we're going to create an, a, a stressful exercise. It's got to be stressful so you kind of forget you're talking to the CEO as you're going through this. And it's also got to be where at the end of it, we identify gaps that Sam has in being able to execute or that the company has. It's not going to reflect on Sam. It's going to reflect on us. We didn't give you the, the knowledge, mm -hmm. skills, and abilities to be able to do what it is we expect you to do. Now, if the third exercise down the road, Sam's still making the same mistakes, well, then we've got another, another issue. But once we've done that, once we've communicated what this is, why it's important, what our expectations are, I do the training, give you knowledge, skills, and ability to be able to do that. I validate that my training was good, right? Then I got to hold you accountable, right? Because mm -hmm. everybody in your company is held accountable. And, you know, depending on the industry, how much it's regulated, all of that stuff, but that accountability speaks very large. The example I used to give, there have been maintenance personnel, aircraft maintenance personnel, who have been held uh, accountable under the Uniform Code of Military Justice and been removed from the service, have done time in incarcerated because they didn't follow proper maintenance procedures mm -hmm. that could put an airplane or a crew or a pilot at risk, right? And yeah. you can find analogies to that in every business. But how often do you see people strategic risk to the business based on your individual behavior on the network, or if you get egregious, you know, there's people that sell their passwords, or all sorts of things. But you're right, at some point, I've got to hold people accountable for those activities. And then that starts to send a message that, hey, this is serious business. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other piece, I've had this discussion with folks in the private sector, I go, have you thought about taking that 30-year-old business unit leader that is just kicking butt and making him the deputy CIO for three years, oh, we can't do that, that'd ruin his career. I said, you gotta be kidding me. Every article you see says, yeah. we need board members that understand this, we need CEOs that understand this. 10 years from now, when it's time for him to compete to be the COO, 
don't you think it'd be pretty valuable for him to have that perspective? I mean, to be, have been immersed in that, to really understand how hard it is to do this job, how, what are all the cultural barriers that you're fighting out there? I mean, he's gonna have a completely, or she is gonna have a completely different view of that. Mm -hmm. So I think as a leader, you can set the environment that says that's important. So that's another part of your account. But this is why we take this seriously. We're taking Sam, yeah. who had biggest sales numbers in the company, over the last three years, and now he's gonna go over and he's gonna be the deputy CIO, yeah. right? And before I do that though, I've gotta know Sam's willing to, he sees this as important, he's gonna take it on, he's gonna invest his time to get smarter in it, and that he has the basic leadership skills that it takes to be just as effective over there as he is over here in this sales organization. And it's something he's passionate about. And right, right, or, or can get passionate about. Yeah. I wasn't super passionate when they first told me, but as I got into <laughs> it and I realized the importance of it, I was oh, yeah. super passionate. And which takes me to maybe one of the final points I would at least like to make that hasn't come up yet. And you kind of talked about the OJT leadership versus this. Yeah. Is that as I went through my career, first eight or 10 years you're flying a fighter and you're very happy with I'm doing better, I'm going becoming an, a flight lead, an instructor pilot, I go to the Air Force's weapon school, kind of the version of Top Gun, only much more difficult. Um, but uh, I'm doing all these things. And then at some point I woke up one day and go, you know what I really enjoy is I enjoy teaching Sam to fly. I am finding that I get a lot of pleasure in how well Sam is flying. And then you go on and you start getting these different leadership positions and then I had an opportunity in the Air Force to uh, a mentor we do a week-long session when you're selected to be a wing commander, you go to Maxwell Air Force Base in Montgomery, Alabama, and this is part of our formal leadership training, is you go and spend a week in there with 20 other people and their spouses. We have a spouse course to that's very much a team-oriented approach. And you get an opportunity to mentor them. And I just, I loved being able to do that because mm -hmm. the satisfaction that I took in being able to take the things that I thought we're good and I thought we're successful and pass them on to you. And then it's your, your job to say, yeah, I like this, I don't like that. This doesn't work for my style, that does work for my style. But I think the more senior you get, I was rarely providing feedback or mentoring or counseling to one of my subordinates who was in a candidate position, almost never about how they do their job. It was mm -hmm. about, what do I see in the culture of your organization? What do I kind of hear from people about tone at the top as I go talk to people in your organization. You know, when I go fly in your organization, what do I feel? Because that's what they need. You know, they're trying to, what are their leadership skills? What kind of culture is that establishing? And being able to effectively mentor people on how to make adjustments at that level, I think is one of the best things you can do for somebody in oh, terms yeah. of helping them develop. No, absolutely. It's interesting all the data that's out there can't get away from it on the generational yeah. contributions of and like the main thing is that the thing that that we have as a baby boomer is you have history that's a value you know that can communicate to people here's why we did it the way we did it here's the decisions we made here's what we've learned this is this is where we were coming from right a lot of times the the frustration of millennials is like your experience doesn't mean anything to me yeah. you know because i'm you know uh, thing millennials don't get is that, you know, we were opinionated and clueless mm -hmm. long before right, they right, were, right? right, right yeah. And then the whole idea, again, of approaching not just, you know, from a generational standpoint, millennials, but anybody, it, they have fresh ideas. They're not burdened by, you know, our experience. They come in and they see yeah. things, it's fresh. To be able to respond to that, and you were talking about the whole gestation of an idea, yeah. to be able to say, okay, I'm not sure everything you come up with is gonna be implementable. Mm -hmm but I really still want you coming up with stuff. Right. You know, that energizes them, and there really is, you know, kernels of, of future greatness in that exchange. If you had one thing, like one soundbite, you were gonna say to somebody that was interested in becoming a more effective leader, whatever level they are in the organization, what would that be? I think I would go back to the very first thing that we talked about. When you find somebody that you really respect, somebody that inspires you, somebody that motivates you, somebody that clearly you trust, is, is watch them very closely and mm -hmm. figure out, okay, what are they doing that makes me feel this way? Yeah. And realizing um, that as you move up, that the reputation you have as a leader is not gonna be built very much on what you say it's gonna be built on the observations that people have of you when you're not really paying attention. And mm -hmm. that's why 
I saw you as a good leader. And so I think taking every opportunity to actually stop, um, a lot of people in the military keep journals, and a lot of what they're writing down is not only good stuff, but I also say, hey, everybody can serve as an example, if only as a bad example. Yeah. There's things you go, I will never do this. But I think if you want to be a successful leader, watch other people around you who you respect as a leader. Um, and no kidding, take notes and think about what fits my style and, and how can I leverage what I've seen uh, to, make, to make me more successful. Be very intentional and very conscious about what constitutes right. good leadership and maybe right. not good leadership in the context of what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Very good advice. Yeah. As I say, leadership is vague. It's one of my favorite quotes, right? <laughs> and as much as we try to model it, at the end of the day, uh, you've got to have a style that works for you uh, and makes you effective. And, uh, and I think that um, as you get more senior, I used to tell these wing commanders, I said, uh, on one hand, you're at a different level, like Marshall saying, what got you here won't get you there. There's some changes. But there's other fundamental things about you, you know, and I think the biggest one is is you make pretty good decisions on less than perfect information. And that will be increasingly required of you as you get more senior. And so um, trusting yourself uh, comes from those years of observing, imitating, practicing, adjusting, mm -hmm. so that as you move up, you've got a good feel. You're confident in what your skills are. And then, like they told us as generals, hey, when you become a general, you're a generalist. That's why you can go be the IT and cyber guy, right? <laughs> and if you've got confidence in your leadership skills, then you can go do that. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, on behalf of everybody yeah. at the Center for yeah, Leadership okay. Studies. Yeah, thanks, Sam. Leadership is a passion of mine, and to be able to participate in something like this with uh, somebody that's got your position in the, in the field, in the industry, in the art, is really, uh, is really a special opportunity. Yeah.